I'm Hannah. I'm Saruti. And welcome to Red Handed. I don't think we have that many things to tell you other than that merch is back. Back, back, back again. Back in the house. Mm-hmm. Back on the streets. Back in the town. Everywhere. Back in the hood. Back on your back. And back on your back. Exactly. So get yourself over to redhandedshop.com for all of your spooky bitch merch needs. I feel like I'm on like late night radio. I know. You've got quite a sultry tone to your voice it's today. It's because I have a sinus infection. <laughs> <laughs> and we are on a very long flight tomorrow, so I will be in a lot of pain, I Uh-oh. think. But before that, before the glory of the painful flight begins, we've got a case for you. We certainly, certainly do. One that we have pondered doing for quite some time, and we've decided to just fucking fuck the police and get on with it. Exactly. No one can stop us. No one can stop us unless they fat to us. I was going to say, unless we get, unless we unless get, we get cancel cultured. Yeah, right. My, I was talking to my sister about this case and I was like, oh, well, I've still got to clean up the script because, you know, as it is at the moment, we you know. Ugh. And she was like, well, I don't think anything actually happened to Salman Rushdie, who obviously this, this whole episode is about. And I was like, he went into hiding for nine years. Yeah. And, <laughs> and a bunch of other people got murdered. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so with that, hopefully we will still be walking the streets next week. But we won't find out until we do it, so let's get on with it. You cannot, listener, open your eyes these days, or even your ears, without being smacked in your beautiful face with cancel culture. It's almost all we think about. Maybe that's because we're content creators and we have to deal with it every day, but it's, it's a very pervasive topic, I would say. And a very real one. John Ronson's got a whole podcast series about it, for fuck's sake. Mm-hmm. Societally speaking, I think everyone is has plumped for this is a new phenomenon, right? It's a new thing. It's a millennial problem. It's a Gen Z problem. Which I do think, I don't think we're at peak yet. Oh, no. And I certainly don't want to ruin your intro, Hannah, that it isn't a (laughs) modern day development. (laughs) But I would say this group of people right now who currently exist on the internet are maybe the best at it. Yes, I think you are probably right. And the you can't say anything nowadays contingent would have you believe that the weaponizing of offense, which we're going to be thinking about a lot this week, is a post-millennium syndrome. But maybe, just maybe, cancel culture has been around a lot longer in a slightly different guise than we may think. And I'm going to tell you, listener, to your disbelieving ears, that maybe the first ever cancelling, global cancelling in the modern world, happened in 1988. Ooh, the year before I was born. What a dark time. (laughs) The dark ages before the advent of Bala. (laughs) So to explore that ambiguous statement from Hannah, that the first ever cancelling in the modern world was the year before I was born, let's look at a cluster of violence and murders that happened all over the world, seemingly at random. Unless, of course, you know the secret connection between all of them. But we're not going to give you that just yet. We're going to make you work for that. Yeah, this is not a... uh, Instant gratification No, you're not getting a medal for taking part here. You've got to do the work. Yeah, this is the anti-modern millennial (laughs) episode. Delayed gratification and no medals just for taking part. In July 1991, 61-year-old Ettore Capriolo was assaulted by a man in his Milan apartment. The assailant snuck into Ettore's house and stabbed him in the neck, chest, and straight through his hands as he tried to defend himself. Then the attacker fled, and no one has ever managed to identify him. Ettore described his attacker as an Iranian man, and that's basically all we know. Just days later, all the way in Tokyo, Hitoshi Igarashi, one of Japan's only Islamic scholars, who'd studied in Iran, was found dead in his office at the University of Tsukuba Ibaraki. He had been repeatedly stabbed in the face and arms. Mm, face stabbing. Yeah, stop Don't stabbing like people in the head. Unlike Ettore in Milan, Hitoshi died. He was just 44. But just like his Italian counterpart, we have absolutely no idea who did it. The investigation into Hitoshi's murder was officially closed in 2006, not really any closer to identifying individual suspects. And I know it's shit, and I know everyone hates it, but I can't help but feel like this case is a bit Dan Brown. Oh, come on. Yeah, like, just because the newspapers don't know who these people are doesn't mean nobody knows. (laughs) But, like, in the interest of journalistic integrity, all anyone will say is probably Iranian, but that's all we know. And it's just like these academics getting Uh stabbed uh in various different countries. 
Yeah, bit down brown. Yeah, like by a monk with a barbed wire garter. (laughs) And the attacks just kept coming. Because a couple of years later, in Norway this time, on the 11th of October, William Nygaard was shot three times outside his home in Oslo and left to die. William actually made it to hospital and thankfully survived. And the three hunting rounds that he'd been shot with, which, by the way, expand when they're in the body miraculously missed Nygaard's spine and every single one of his vital organs. William Nygaard's doctor said that the gunman was either the best shot in the world or the worst. Which I thought was a very funny thing to say. Mm -hmm. What Mm -hmm. a quick-witted doctor. And yet again, authorities don't know who this gunman was, and they probably still don't. Or so they say. But everyone knew what the motive was. In fact, the motives for the attacks on Ettore... Hitoshi and William Nygaard were the same. So what did all of these far-flung men have in common? They had all been involved in the translation or publication of a book called The Satanic Verses, written by Salman Rushdie. And that might sound harmless, how bad can a book be, you might be asking. In this case, uh, pretty bad. All three men had openly said in the press that they had no problem in translating or publishing the book. In fact, after he was shot... William Nygaard ordered a reprint. Yes, William. Yeah, he, uh, Salman Rushdie, who obviously we will explain a lot more about him as we go on, but he contacted William Nygaard after he was attacked and he was like, I'm so sorry, I feel so responsible. And William Nygaard was just like, don't worry about it, mate. We ordered a reprint. Paperbacks? Yes. Excellent. Love it. Don't fucking bow down to the mob. No. Take it. Buy yourself a reprint. And the uproar and subsequent violence that followed the publication of the Satanic Verses is now referred to as the Rushdie Affair. And it was so explosive that you might expect that the book would be full of vitriol, racism, violence, spiritual assaults, and perhaps even a call to arms. That's absolutely what I thought. I remember, obviously this happened before I was born, but I remember on the news when people would refer to the satanic verses and knowing a reasonable amount about the outrage it caused. I really, really thought until I started looking into it there would, it would be like an anarchist cookbook of how to take down Islam and like all of the problems with Islam as a religion and like in no way veiled some sort of like, like a call to arms. Like that's what I thought it was. But it's not. It's not even close. I think the name possibly also misleads a lot of people. Yeah, and we're going to get into why it's called that later on and there's actually a very good reason why it's called that. But yes, I thought it was probably a line by line takedown of the Quran is what I thought it was. But yes, the satanic verses isn't any of those things. It isn't even a radical critique of religion. It's not a manifesto. It's not a battle cry. It's not even set in reality. It's a novel. So let's just let that sink in. It is not a piece of non-fiction. It is not some sort of attack on a particular religion or religion as a whole. It's not even a philosophy. No, it's It's a a story story book. Possibly some people might say it's a dog whistle, laced into a story. But, I don't know, to us it doesn't even really fit that description either. So let's have a look at the man behind the mania. A man whose name most of you will probably be familiar with. Not least because we've said it at least five times today already. (laughs) It is, of course, Mr Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie was born into a Kashmiri Muslim family in Mumbai, back when it was still called Bombay in 1947. His mum was a teacher, and his dad was a lawyer who went to Cambridge. The Rushdie family lived a very comfortable life in India. And then, like his dad before him, little Salman was sent off to school in England. It's worth pointing out here that although the Rushdie family were Muslim, Salman went to the mosque maybe once a year, on Eid, and that was about it. Yeah, supermarket Muslims, I think. Culturally, yes. Ideologically, possibly less so. Salman went to rugby, which is a public boarding school founded in 1567, where the sport rugby was famously invented. I did not know that. So this is one of my favourite public school facts and also the most pathetic. So rugby was invented at rugby and their rival school is Winchester. And Winchester don't play rugby, they play Winchester football. Isn't that pathetic? To today? Yes, to today. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah, right Yeah, it's true. Off. Look it up. But it's the exact same game. 
I mean, I don't think they're allowed to play the exact same game. I think some of the rules might be slightly different, but it's it looks pretty similar, yeah. So Winchester don't have a rugby team? No, they have a Winchester football team. So they only play themselves. One I was going to say, so who have they got to play against? <laughs> Oh, you fuck it up. What a bunch of toss pods. Yeah, that's so that's ridiculous. Quite literally, it. yeah. So it's uh, it's pretty pretty terrible. It genuinely felt like word association. When you said that, it was like toss pot is the word to say. <laughs> fuck <laughs> off. My God. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Rugby is one of the original public schools in this country. It's a very prestigious place to go. Its most famous alumni include epic peace misunderstander Neville Chamberlain, megapedo Lewis Carroll, and the inventor of Australian rules football, William Webb Ellis. So maybe he didn't like rugby either. <laughs> I don't know how different Australian rules is to rugby rugby. I think, and I don't know this, but one of my neighbours when I was growing up was in the Navy and he spent a lot of time in Australia and he was like, we would play the Australian forces and we would play rugby and they would play Australian rules. And so you could kind of, you could kind of get through it, you know. So Salmon, perhaps predictably in this wonderful country of ours as a foreign, brown, unathletic and intelligent child, didn't love his time at the super white, super elitist establishment of rugby school. He's never spoken fondly of his time at rugby and he left it behind to read history at King's College, Cambridge, where it seems that he had a much easier time of it. When he talks, I highly recommend listening to Salman Rushdie's Desert Island Discs because it gives a bit more of an insight that you're not going to get anywhere else. And he says on Desert Island Discs, he was like, I feel like if I hadn't have been brown or if I hadn't have been unathletic, if I just had one thing that I could do, but because I was the quadruple whammy, I was just the easiest target. Oh, yeah. But I feel like most people hated their time at school and probably most people who went to public school hated their time at public school unless they were the fucking top bloke. And even still, they probably all still get a job in Parliament. <laughs> it just doesn't exactly. Matter. I just think it's the typical kind of place that I can imagine a very rich Indian family in 1947 having sent their son. Mm -hmm. But I feel like everybody was probably having a fucking shit time of it. So fair enough. You went to Cambridge, Salmon. Mm -hmm. He you turned did. out all right. Apart from the fatwa. <laughs> Apart from the fatwa. I think it's much easier to go to Cambridge when your dad went there, but you know, never mind. So Salmon, a natural academic, flew through his studies at Cambridge and even found the time to do some occasional acting. He mainly stuck to straight plays, but he did make the occasional appearance on the famous Footlights stage. Which is, of course, the comedy C yeah, arena, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. So Cambridge Footlights has launched, you know, Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie. They're all Footlights boys. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure, like, I don't know if Olivia Colman, but definitely David Mitchell as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's the place. It's the place. And when he did turn his mind to his studies, Salmon thought a lot about just how much information we have about the origins of his native religion, Islam, compared with, for example, Christianity. We know much more about the life of Muhammad than we do about the endeavours of everybody's favourite carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth. I, I, mean, I was talking to you about this in the office when I was writing this. I knew next to nothing about the life of Muhammad until now, but like it is very interesting and it's very different to the doctrine that I grew up with in Christianity because, you know, there are literal treaties that have his signature on it. Like he absolutely definitely was a historical figure. But is it because, you know, the church tries very hard to, and this is not a hot take, but the church tries very hard to remove Christ from humanity, like he is a divine being, whereas Muhammad is a human. He is just a prophet and in touch with the Almighty. Kind of like giving too much of a backstory to Jesus makes him too human. Uh, no, because I think the church have always been completely obsessed with proving that he did actually exist. And a lot of people question that, myself included. But maybe that's again it. You give too many details, people can poke too many holes in it and be like, he didn't. But, like, if they existed, they would exist. Yeah. So 600 years is a big gap. Oh, yeah, because they got much better at writing things down in those 600 years. Now, as much as we do know about the life of Muhammad, there are, of course, many things that we don't know about the Prophet. And those plot holes stayed on Rushdie's mind for his entire life. Once he graduated with a second-class degree, he went to Pakistan, where his family had actually moved to. And those eagle-eared among you will have figured out that it is, of course, because he was born in 1947, which is the year that India got independence from Britain. He goes to school in England, goes off to university. During that time, obviously partition happens. Yeah, the cheeky little partition. Mass movement. I believe it is still to this day the largest human migration in history, during which time millions of people 
that might be overblown, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions, moved from what is now India into what is now Pakistan. I recently learned that Pakistan is an acronym. How is it? Yeah. Punjab, Afghan, border states, Kashmir, Sindh and Baluchistan. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. And of course, India, I suppose, in there is no Indian language, but in the original naming of it was, of course, Hindustan. Yes, I didn't know Which that, is yeah. land of the Hindus to be like, fuck everybody else. Which is why, understandably, Salman Rushdie's family, being Muslims, left Mumbai to go live in Pakistan, which is where he heads to. But he doesn't stay there very long because London was calling and he soon moved back to the UK to follow his dramatic dreams. Like all of us in our early 20s, Salman had absolutely no idea where he would end up. He always hoped that he would be a writer, but he decided that he needed a backup plan. So when he was back in London, he tried his hand at acting professionally. And when that didn't go according to plan, and he was, by his own words, starving to death, he entered the ultra-competitive world of advertising. Yeah, because I'm guessing his rich dad was not going to be sending his son money so that he could try be an actor in London. I don't think so, no. And to Salman's surprise, he was very, very good at advertising. There are more taglines attributed to a young Salman Rushdie than you may realise. Naughty but nice being the most famous. Mm, do we know where he used that first? It's like tea cakes or something. Oh, Yeah, and there's, there was another... He did one for American Express that was like, that'll do, or something like that. Oh. Uh, yeah. So he, there's like quite a lot that you would recognise that are like, they're, they're someone rushed you. Wow. Is it Tunnock's Tea Cakes? Tunnock's Tea Cakes. Yes, I naughty think, but nice. Yes, I think it is. I think, that, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Do you know what they are? They are. <laughs> they you, absolutely You know what, Salman, you, you got that one right. They absolutely are. I love a Tunnock's Tea Cake. So now he'd figured out that he was good at writing taglines for things. He was making enough money to work just a few days a week. And the young Rushdie now had time on his hands. So he decided to follow his literary heart and penned his first ever novel. This first try was not particularly successful. It was a semi-sci-fi children's book called Grimace. And almost everyone, including critics, ignored it. But what do we do when we don't succeed? No, we don't lie down and cry. We don't even shout at the top of our lungs, that's showbiz, kid! That's what I do every time something goes wrong. We try again. And that's what Salman Rushdie did. And his second work of fiction, Midnight's Children, was an international sensation, met with clamouring acclaim, and it even won a Booker Prize in 1981. Midnight's Children is about India gaining independence, it's about partition, etc. And it's about two children, in particular, who were born within the first hour of independence in India. It was very much like speaking to the experience of a lot of brown people mm -hmm. at that time. Which is why he gets so popular so mm, fast. Absolutely. And uh, it's interesting that his first book was a sci-fi because Midnight's Children isn't a sci-fi, but it is what is described as like magical realist literature. Mm, mystical realism is very much his vibe. And of course, this book, given how incredibly popular it was, pushed Salman Rushdie into the spotlight. Now he was cool, a ladies' man even, a far cry from the foreign dork that he'd been at rugby. And what's more, he was a hero to the Asian community in Britain. There was an enormous diaspora to Britain from India, Pakistan and Bangladesh from the 60s all the way through to the 90s. And for the first time, during that mass migration, there was a brown man telling brown stories. And also, it was a brown man telling brown stories in a way that was consumable, not just by brown people in the West, mm -hmm. but by other people. Absolutely. I think I've listened to a lot of people's sort of first-hand accounts of like when they first heard about Salman Rushdie, like a lot of like British Asian migrants speaking about it. And they were like, you know, it was a brown man telling brown stories, but he was sat at the white table. And that had never happened before. Absolutely. And while a lot of people did love Salman Rushdie at this point and love Midnight's Children, not every brown person was enamoured with him. Mrs Gandhi actually sued him for libel, and Midnight's Children really, really, really pissed off the leader of Pakistan. But Rush didn't let any of that faze him. He took all of the criticism, and even the lawsuits, in his stride, boldly proclaiming that art happens at the edge. Salmon. <laughs> it's true, though. I think it's mm. just, again, look, I don't want to make this whole episode about cancel culture, but like, too late. Before, too late. <laughs> it's again, that art happens at the edge 
like what an important and poignant sentence to say because yeah. these days people like losing their shit because somebody made a joke that they didn't like or saying something that they didn't like it's a joke it's art mm. it's somebody trying something it's a performance and even if it's not we only move forward and things only happen and things only get agitated and reshaped if you're pushing it to the edge absolutely I, like could not agree more and Salman Rushdie wasn't just trying to be edgy. He was really trying to make a change. He was a fixture at anti-racism rallies. The British Asian community united behind him. And this is a difficult thing to do because Asian, Asian, like, what does that mean? Again, it's like so monolithic, like it doesn't really mean anything. There's also not a lot of unity between various Asian communities. And it certainly doesn't change just because they all happen to be in Britain and be brown. Yeah, I think that the theme we will see through this episode is that is absolutely true. That is not how the white establishment saw it. But back to this, Salman Rushdie is doing a great job of rallying and uniting the British Asian community. He was one of them and he had made it, which is all anybody ever wants. They want one of their tribe to succeed. And when they do, everyone's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, now we know. And this love that all the brownos had for Mr. Salman Rushdie was exactly why what happened next was hailed as such a blood-curdling betrayal by many. That betrayal would take five years to rear its head, and that's because Salman took that long to write his next novel, the famous, the infamous, Satanic Verses. I mean, you always feel like your second book... Is it going to be oh, ever as good? Oh, the difficult second album, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like, it gets you fatward. I also just don't think that uh, Salman Rushdie ever thought he wasn't going to smash it. Like, I think that's another thing that's so haunting about his Desert Island Discs is it, it's recorded in 88. So it's, just, it's his press tour for Satanic Verses, basically. And obviously at the end of Desert Island Discs, they talk about what you would take with you on a desert island and they ask him how he would do with solitude. And he's like, oh, I think I'd be all right. And I'm like, oh, little do you know, Salman. Little do you know, you're going to have a lot of that in six months. The confidence of having a killer first novel and also having grown up in an incredibly wealthy family. Mm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. After the raging success of Midnight's Children, Salman had no issues getting an £850,000 advance for his book from Penguin. In the 80s. Oh, yeah. And at the time, that is a staggering amount of money. And for a book advance also. Wow. And then the Satanic Verses hit the shelves in 1988. So let's ask the annoying question that you ask your friends when they're reading their book on holiday. What's it about? Crucially, and please hold on to this with your grubby little fingers for this whole episode, The Satanic Verses is a novel. Here are the basics. Two main characters, they're called Gibriel and Saladin, and you don't need a PhD in Islamic studies to figure out who is the goody and who is the baddie. These two men sit next to each other on a plane that's hijacked by Sikh terrorists and then blown up. As the pair speed toward the earth and certain death, Gibriel transforms into an angel and flies them both to London. Back to that mystic realism. He loves a mystic realism to Salman. Gibriel becomes more and more angelic as the book progresses and Saladin has a worse turn of luck and becomes more and more like his name suggests, like the devil. He grows goat legs and gets bad breath, for example. And like we've said, mystical realism or magical realism is very much Rushdie's whole vibe. So throughout the book, the reader is never really sure whether these things are actually happening or if it's just something that's happening in the characters' minds. And he does this all as a reflection of the immigrant experience. Yeah, I think that's actually, if you take all of the politics out of it, which I never successfully do, but if you do... As a reader going through the story, you're never sure whether it's a metaphor, whether it's a dream sequence, whether it's actually happening, whether it happened. You know, it's all, you're on unsteady ground the whole time. Yeah, and that's basically what magical realism is as a form of literature. It's meant to feel like surreal things happening within a very realistic context so that you can't tell the difference between the two. I'm no literary graduate, but that's what my understanding is. And these dream sequences in the book are incredibly difficult to extract from the base story itself. So you might be thinking, that sounds perfectly fine. What could possibly be upsetting about any of that? It's just a bit of a challenging read. It's just a bit 
trippy, yeah, maybe. Yeah, should be long, too. Well, lots was apparently very upsetting and difficult about this particular form of writing and this particular book. Let's start with the title, The Satanic Verses. So this is actually a myth surrounding the Quran, which most Muslims now consider to be totally made up. But here's the gist of it. When Muhammad was downloading the Quran from the angel Gabriel, he had a scribe called Abi Sar, who copied down everything Muhammad said, and also, according to the legend, added some bits in himself, meaning that the Quran was not entirely the word of God. So the Satanic Verses isn't a title that Salman's pulled out of the air. It is the name of this myth surrounding the Quran. And the Quran being verbatim is a pivotal belief in Islam. The Quran is not up for interpretation. It is word for word dictated by Allah himself through Gabriel to Muhammad. So suggesting in any way, shape or form that some of the Quran may not be 100% the word of God is going to get some backs up. Oh, yes, indeed. We've talked about this before. I can't remember which episode, but there is a very good series that's put together by Al Jazeera. And you can watch all of them on YouTube. It's called Head to Head. And most of them are um, hosted by Mehdi Hassan, who I'm not a fan of Mehdi Hassan, but he's there and being loud. But his guests are mostly fantastic. And there is an excellent, excellent, excellent author who is a Muslim woman. She's also a lesbian. I cannot remember her name for the life of me, but I'll find that particular episode and leave it in the um, episode description. And she comes on and talks about how she believes in the Quran. She's a Muslim. She believes in Islam. She follows it. But she also says that she doesn't think word for word that the Quran is the word of God and that it has been interpreted by man. It's been written down by a man and men are fallible. And therefore, the Quran is not a perfect verbatim, infallible text. And Mehdi Hassan looks like he's going to have a meltdown. Mm. And he says that flies directly in the face of what Islam is. Like the belief that the Quran is the word for word verbatim doctrine of Allah is the pivotal belief. So absolutely, someone saying that, her saying that in the 2000s caused some people to be upset. This was way back when. Exactly. So the story that Saru just told the scribe adding some bits in is one version of this myth, right? But there's another one, which actually causes a bit more issue. So the capturing of Mecca was no easy task for Muhammad and the first Muslims. Because the taking of Mecca, it's many, many polytheistic groups. And then Muhammad unites them all under Islam, under one God. But in the beginning, allegedly, there is a story that he was like, oh, in the beginning, it's okay to pray to Allah. And then also three others, three other deities are okay. And the thinking behind that is that he's trying to get more people on his side, right? You can't just jump from having a whole host of people believing in a polytheistic series of religions. People living almost like quite probably tribally living in, believing in various different Absolutely, polytheistic yeah. religions to suddenly saying, you're all now going to believe the same thing and uh, you only believe in one now. Mm. That would be an incredibly difficult thing to swallow. Yeah, and one could argue that it's actually quite a tolerant policy. However, so Muhammad proclaims that it's okay to pray to Allah and also these three other female deities, right? Then either the angel Gabriel appeared to him or Muhammad came up with it himself. That couldn't possibly be true. It couldn't possibly be true that you can only worship one God, but actually three other ones. I love how you're like, maybe the angel Gabriel came to him and said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. But that's the story. It's yeah, either, yeah. Either, the, either the angel did okay. it or Muhammad came up with it himself. This idea must have come straight from the devil to trick him, which is why they're called the satanic verses and why they had to come out of the Quran. So the verses about polytheism were deemed to be satanic and they were taken out of the Quran. Okay, so the parts that had originally said, allegedly, that Muhammad had said, that God was totally chill with you still praying to three other female deities yeah. is the part that's referred to as the satanic verses. Yes. But whether they existed at all ever anyway is also up for debate. Yes. Okay, got it. And interestingly, it doesn't just stop at it being debated. In fact, all versions of this story are now widely considered to have been totally made up as part of an anti-Islam smear campaign. And it's considered impossible that Muhammad could have made such a mistake. 
even if it was to appease some people, he needed to be on his side. All's fair in love and war. It's very interesting that people would say that this was an anti-Islam smear campaign, mm-hmm. and that's why this story was created. It's weird to me because it's only highly impactful, that story, if you already believe in the Quran and mm-hmm. believe that it is the word of God. So for it to be an anti-Islam smear campaign, that story is not going to make a bunch of people who don't believe in the Quran be like, oh, do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it already posits the belief that you would have to believe and hold the Quran to be the word of God for that to be that impactful, maybe. I think that's true. I think the generally what people point to of why the satanic verses is, you know, uh, something that everyone would like to sweep under the rug is that it indicates exactly what that lady was saying on head to head was that maybe the Quran isn't 100 percent and maybe Muslims are just following something that is not the word of God. Sure. So they're basically saying you don't need to believe in it, but it's basically saying the satanic verses hearsay is saying that the Quran is fallible. Exactly. Okay. So the title of the book, The Satanic Verses, was always going to upset some people. He was picking a particularly divisive thing to go after oh, anyway. Yeah. I am in no way saying in this episode that Salman Rushdie was not trying to be provocative. And again, I'll come back to saying the thing that he himself said, art happens on the edge. And he knew that. And I think that again, it comes back to Just because somebody is making a joke or saying something and they're trying to be provocative, that doesn't mean that they deserve to get cancelled or fatwood or murdered or attempted to be murdered. I think that's the thing that I've just been thinking about so much is like offence being aligned with violence or offence being aligned with therefore that means action needs to be taken or offence meaning anything at all, quite frankly. The fact that you think you the proverbial you, this person who's being offended and demands action be taken. The idea that that person thinks that they are so special, that their feelings must be protected at all costs. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So what? You were offended. Yeah. Stop reading. Stop listening. Stop watching. It's as simple as that. But clearly not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a rest of this episode to tell (laughs) you about. So yes, we know Salman knew that he was being particularly provocative with this title. After all, it is a direct reference to a story about the prophet, which is considered now to be untrue, and to some, an actual smear. And Salman was not ignorant, he was a Muslim, he would have known that. So, some find it difficult to believe that he wasn't being deliberately inflammatory. And again, even if he was, so fucking what? And we're not even close to being done, guys, there's loads to come. Because the book is massively long, as Hannah said, and impossible to summarise. So let's strip it back to what we absolutely need to know. Every subplot in the book, in some way, examines or even questions Islam. Let's look at some examples. In part five of the Satanic Verses, a young girl claims to be receiving divine messages from Allah, telling her to lead her followers to Mecca through the Arabian Sea, which would part, just like the Red Sea did for Moses and the Jews as they left Egypt. And that might seem like a reasonably harmless parable, but it could be interpreted to mean that Allah and the Judeo-Christian God are the same one, which is something you can argue over for hours, and we just do not have time. Every religion has a different perspective. I'm not even going to try. Let's just move on. That tale didn't cause too much of a problem, but it pricked some people's ears up. And it did set the scene for upcoming outrage. The next details were the real troublemakers. In the Satanic Verses, there is a character called Mahound, and the reader follows Mahound through his life, which is a satirical rewrite of the life of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. Mahound was a name used by Christian crusaders to defame Muhammad. It's actually considered a huge insult to the prophet. And Salman, being at the very least culturally Muslim, definitely knew that it was an inflammatory moniker. Oh, absolutely. I mean... The fact that he uses it. Yeah, he knows, man. He knows. But art happens at the edge. Exactly. And next up is the bit that really pissed people off. The actual satanic versus bit. Gabriel, who fell out of the plane and turned into an angel, starts to get messages in his dreams from Mahound. Gabriel, who is a fictional character, let's remember, is not totally convinced that he believes these messages from the equally fictional character, Mahound. This theme of a person being told to believe something 
that they're not quite sure of pervades the entire book, and some argue that it implies the entire story, and therefore the Quran, is actually narrated by the devil. Salman, as we know, loved looking into what we know and thereby what we don't know about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, which pokes Islam in some very touchy places. Now, like any holy book, the Quran has lots of holes and lots of contradictions, and Rushdie presses on many of these in his works. Orthodox Islamic understanding of the lifestyle of Muhammad, his multiple wives, for example, are recognised to be a part of a divine plan. But anti-Muslim polemicists argue that Muhammad was just a human man with a lot of power who just so happened to want a lot of wives. So polygamy, which is prevalent in Islam, is either God's intention, which is what the majority of Muslims believe, or if it is just because Muhammad was a man who just so happened to want a lot of wives and it wasn't actually to do with anything God said, then generations of Muslims have been influenced by the fallibility of man. I'm uncomfortable. But let's keep going. And this divisive idea is pushed even further in the satanic verses. There's a bit in the story where the characters come across a brothel, and this brothel is called the Curtain. And Curtain is the direct translation of the Arabic word for veil slash headscarf. So essentially, he's calling this brothel the hijab, right? And inside this brothel are sex workers, and they are all named after the wives of Muhammad. So that really pissed people off. Yeah, I mean, obviously, not being a Muslim, I don't feel uncomfortable by that, but I can understand the controversy. Yeah. And he sure as fuck would too. Absolutely. Now, so pissed off were the masses that as soon as the book was published by Penguin, or Viking Penguin as it was called in 1988, it was met with widespread protest from the British Muslim community. Their main gripe was the disrespect of the Prophet and the insinuation that the Quran is not completely and utterly the word of God. The bit about Muhammad's wives being sex workers certainly didn't help either. And the insinuation that Muhammad was making things up as he went along didn't do Salman Rushdie any favours. Death threats soon poured in, and quickly, Salman Rushdie was under 24-hour armed guard protection. A mosque in Leicester even photocopied the offending pages of the novel and stuck them up on their own walls and sent them to other mosques all over the country. Muslims wrote impassioned letters to their MPs and held peaceful protests, but no one really took any notice. Until a protest in Bradford, during which they burned a copy of the satanic verses. And of course, that photo made it into the papers. We always get there. Get there in the end. Book burning. Yeah. And before anybody's eye, well, like, we would never do that now. Or my side would never do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. This is the thing that I found the most fascinating about this case, is that in the 80s, Salman Rushdie was as far left as you could get. And now the left wouldn't side with him, I don't think. So after the book burning, what's the phrase, burn the book, burn the man? I keep thinking of spare the rod, spare the child. <laughs> So it makes the papers, and one publication ran the headline, How to Spot a Mad Mullah, Mullah being like an elder in Islam, like a scholar, essentially. And the Daily Mail also stuck their oar in writing, Who Asked Muslims to Run Our Lives? <laughs> what? I know. <laughs> and they also followed up that stonker of a headline with the accusation that Muslims were taking Bradford back to the Middle Ages. Later, in 1989, there was a protest on Parliament Square attended by fifteen to 20,000 people. 20,000 people? Yeah. Fucking hell. Yeah. And it was at this protest that an effigy of Salman Rushdie was burnt in front of the Palace of Westminster. This is one of the few things that I think does unite the Asian diaspora. Burning of effigies. Love a burning of effigy. Absolutely mad for it. You see it all the time. And with the protests and the burnings of books and or effigies, any middle ground vanished. Members of the public, Asian or not, who wanted to support Rushdie's right to free speech, kind of had nowhere to go because what the press were doing, well, what was happening was a war against all Muslims and therefore, in the white British understanding, all brown people. It was tricky to align with anyone. It became very polarised, very binary, like, are you with us or are you against us? Are you Western or are you not? And this is the problem. And I think this idea of you cannot support his right to have freedom of speech 
Because if you do, it means you're against all of the Muslims and all of the immigrants and all of the brown people. And it must be because you're a racist. And it's like, well, no, you can be not a racist and be like, people should be allowed to write what they want and say what they want. And I think this whole argument of freedom of speech, again, we're talking about a case from the 80s. And I feel like it feels like a pasto case mm -hmm. in many ways. But it also does not feel at all like a pasto case because now so many people very insidiously, I think, say anybody who argues for free speech must just be doing it so they can say horrible racist things. Mm. And I'm like, well, no, if anything, minorities are the people that benefit the most from the freedom of speech. So shutting down freedom of speech and saying that anybody who's calling for freedom of speech must only be doing it so they can say horrible, vicious things is fundamentally missing the entire point. People can say what they want and then you can decide. It's also this kind of brainwashing or like babyifying. That's not the right word. That's not a word. Infantilizing. Infantilizing of the public. This idea that somehow if you, Hannah, hear a Nazi speak tomorrow, that you're suddenly going to be like, I'm a Nazi. Mm. You're right. I agree with everything. And you're allowed to do that. What I mean is like this infantilizing of people being told, you can't listen to this joke. You can't listen to this person speak. We must deplatform this person because it might make you change your mind. What a bizarre thing for us to think in this day and age. And also the argument that people make, which is like, well, what if they're inciting violence? Well, there are laws in this country and in most countries that will protect from people who are inciting violence. They can be prosecuted under different laws if they're inciting violence. It's not a freedom of speech issue. I think people don't understand it, so they just throw it about when they don't know where else to go. Anyway, where was I? Up until the Rushdie affair, the South Asian diaspora in the UK had been understood by the predominantly white population of Britain to be a pretty homogeneous, pretty monolithic, like I was saying before. It didn't really matter where the brown people were from. Bangladesh, India, South Africa, Saudi, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. If they were brown, then they were just the P word. The P word, which, I don't know, people get offended. I can say it. Can I say it since you I get called it? it? Fucking yeah. Paki, there you go. I've been called it, so I'm going to say it. This word was pretty ubiquitous in the 70s and 80s in Britain, and it was often featured on primetime BBC television programming, along with lots of other brown people stereotypes. Yeah, I think like the brown people stereotypes in this country that were all over the television is like, if you're brown, your dad runs a corner shop. You leave your shoes outside your door. Which you do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm and trying my to dad think of other ones. Lots of, lots of brown people's dads do run yeah. corner shops. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when, when I was growing up, well, obviously it wasn't in the 70s or 80s, but we used to watch Goodness Gracious Me. Mm. And um, do you know what? People might look back at that now and be like, it's so offensive, blah, blah, blah. Like you'd never do that now. Like almost like it was like Indian Little Britain mm. or something. I'll tell you, as a family of brownos, we fucking loved that shit. We watched it every week when it was on. If you don't believe us that the P word was bandied around on the BBC in the 70s and 80s. There's a BBC sound series called Fatwa. And in that they have clips, they have like a supercut essentially of loads of uses of that word and also stereotypes of brown people in Britain that were primetime television. And yeah, it's no secret that England has propagated decades of racism. Some would argue it still does. I don't know. Are there elements of racism in this country? There are elements of racism in every country. Try going to India. It's one of the most racist places on earth and everyone's brown. But under Thatcher here in the UK, when she closed the mines, she crushed the mills, the unemployment levels of male Asians was at 50% in the north of the country. Unsurprisingly, this had a plethora of negative effects. But let's focus on the most obvious. The rampant, casual and violent racism in the UK that meant that South Asian diaspora was very angry. This is the thing. It's kind of the perfect storm, isn't it? It was just the destruction of many working class communities in the North, thanks to many decisions that were made. And also the racism that people felt. There's no doubt about that. I think what annoys me is when people still pretend like the racism is as bad as it was in the 70s mm. and 80s. It undermines what people then went through. Absolutely. And that's the thing I don't like. And this was never more clearly highlighted to me than what my dad once said to me. My parents came to this country in the 90s as white collar workers my dad came here and worked in a bank our next door neighbor when i was growing up is a punjabi family and the husband of that family 
born and brought up in this country and he's older than my dad so he, or maybe around the same age so he must have grown up in the 70s and 80s and he was always very 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 distanced from white people let's say so for example two of my closest friends when I was growing up were these two white boys who lived on my street and I used to walk to school with them and I used to walk home with them every day my parents never saw a single issue in that he used to tell my dad that he shouldn't let me be friends with them and I was like what the hell he grew up here how can he think that and you don't my dad was like he grew up here and faced a shitload of racism from white people when he was growing up I moved here in the 90s and I've never faced any racism so of course I don't feel the same way so I think that's the thing is like let's not pretend like it's as bad let's focus on how bad it was then and how it shaped this situation Mm -hmm. so unsurprisingly like we said this kind of thing led to a lot of very angry people and civil unrest that had been bubbling for some time especially in places like Bradford, which was a cotton milling town that hired millions of South Asian migrants in its factories, were really struggling. And the Rushdie affair gave the Muslim contingent of the South Asian population something to hang their anger on. As a group, they had been mistreated and looked down upon for years, and then after Thatcher, suddenly they had no fucking jobs. And the country, the UK, had promised them a better life, and they didn't feel like they were getting it. And I think that the reason that the vitriol that comes out against Salman Rushdie happens is not something that won't have occurred to most people, but it's the idea of we're facing racism from the white people in this country. We feel like the government is now fucking us by shutting down all the textiles factories, the cotton factories, the mining, the coaling, all of that, the industries that we were working in. And now you, as a browno, but who happens to be Cambridge educated and public school attending you've turned on us too it's the traitor within the ranks quote unquote is always going to provoke more hatred than somebody you already expect it from exactly so british muslims obviously we are generalizing but we have to generalize to tell the story so let's go british muslims saw the rushdie affair not only as proof of their long-held suspicions that the government didn't give a single shit about them but as salt in the wound too and again it's difficult and maybe people will disagree with me but you're allowed to disagree with me I don't disagree with me, (laughs) but um, (laughs) this idea of Salman Rushdie coming to this country and writing a book that was directly provocative is a book that would have never been published in many other countries because those countries would have prioritized religion over freedom of speech. To me, one of the main British values that I will always value is the idea of we're meant to represent a country that supports freedom of speech. Yeah. And it's like he was doing something that should be applauded for being British, which was being provocative, being a bit eccentric, writing a book that challenged things. But people didn't like it. No. And there was a bit of a narrative within the British Muslim population that if they just took it, which I think some people felt like was expected of them and had been expected of them for decades as their jobs left and as they sustained racist abuse and bricked through corner shop windows, etc. There was a narrative of like, oh, well, if we just take it, if we stay passive then we could end up like the Muslims in Bosnia and Palestine, mistreated, overlooked, abused, and just expected to take it forever. And after the book burning and the effigy burning, there was a significant increase in racist attacks in the UK against the South Asian community with breaking windows, death threats, etc., etc. Bradford had recently elected its first brown mayor, and he was doing things like campaigning for halal school meals, blah, 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 blah. So there was a rhetoric amongst white people of being like, Go back to brown land, though, if you love it so much. Yeah. And this reaction was not just UK specific. The satanic verses was banned in a number of countries, including Bangladesh and Venezuela. Bangladesh, I can understand. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, sure. (laughs) Never mind. Never mind. (laughs) There were riots in Mumbai and the bookshops of Liberties in London and the Penguin Store in New York sustained explosions. So Barnes and Noble also refused to stock the book until, and I love this, Stephen King threatened, saying, quote, if you don't sell the satanic verses, you don't sell Stephen King. Oh, yeah. What a man. What a man. What a man. What a man. And of course, sales will always prevail. They certainly will. With such a globally volatile reaction, you do have to wonder why no one saw this coming. And Penguin UK certainly had no idea. Cultural sensitivity training, which I despise, was still decades away. But one Penguin employee did ring the bell of doom before publication. 
because he knew that if this book was published in India, then there would be no more Penguin India left. Still, Penguin India, or even straw versions of himself being burned in Westminster, were the least of Salman Rushdie's problems. On the 14th of February 1989, the then Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini, issued a fatwa. And that fatwa went like this. I would like to inform all the intrepid Muslims in the world that the author of the book titled The Satanic Verses, which has been compiled, printed and published in opposition to Islam, the Prophet and the Quran, as well as those publishers who were aware of its contents, have been declared Madar al-Dam, which means those whose blood must be shed. I call on all zealous Muslims to execute them quickly, wherever they find them, so that no one will dare insult Islam again. And in case that didn't make it abundantly clear what a fatwa is, a fatwa is a declaration of a death sentence to be carried out by literally anybody in the name of Islam. Yeah. There's a very good podcast that Hannah and I have talked about many times before. It's called Conflicted. If you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. We love it. And on there is a man named Eamon Dean who has a fatwa against him. And he's now a banker in London, but he talks a lot in the podcast about how sometimes he'll just be standing waiting for the tube and he's like, is that man looking at me? Mm -hmm. And he's like, yep, he's going to try to kill me. And he like, will leave. I think that's something that I only very recently started to fully understand about fatwa. Like I assumed that it was like Ayatollah Khomeini was going to send like a Muslim ninja to come and and it's no, it's like literally any Muslim who hears this call, go and kill him. Open source. Exactly. And this fatwa wasn't just on Salman's head. It was anyone involved with the publication or translation of the satanic verses. They were all under threat, which is realistically hundreds of people. Now, it might be tricky to get your head around the idea that killing someone is fine, but writing words is not. But I would say that that is a lot of how I feel like people who love a bit of cancel culture think. They seem to think this person isn't allowed to say the things that they did because it's offending somebody. But I can now act with any level of vitriol in cancelling them. Yeah. Because now that they have said that thing, they are no longer human and therefore deserve no respect or anything. And all of the virtue I'm screaming about, I can throw all that out the window and I could even physically hurt them. Yeah. Or dox them or threaten them or say whatever the fuck I want about them on the internet. So, yes, maybe you feel like it's a leap with the killing. But I don't feel like it's that big of a jump. It's a bit of a hop. But let's keep going. A bounty of 7 million US dollars was placed on Rushdie's head. So, who exactly was this Ayatollah Khomeini character? Well, he was instrumental in the overthrowing of the Iranian Shah, widely regarded as a puppet of the West, and Khomeini was the true leader of Iran for many. The Iranian revolution is a topic for another day. Don't worry, we've already got a case in mind for it. But you have probably seen the pictures of women in bikinis in a pre-revolution Iran compared with the full niqab required by law in a post-revolution Iran. After Ayatollah Khomeini rose to power, Saddam Hussein, dictator of neighbouring nation Iraq, attacked Iran. And this war lasted eight years. And eventually, Iran lost. After the war was lost, some say that Ayatollah Khomeini never smiled again. Oh, the world's saddest man. (laughs) Don't kill me. He's dead. (laughs) Don't worry about it. (laughs) He may not have been smiling. That doesn't make me feel any safer. (laughs) But he was more bitter, more radical than he had ever been before. And he was doing a lot of killing. He executed 5,000 of his own people and even wanted to annihilate all of his army leaders after the end of the war. He was dissuaded, though, when some bright spark suggested that now was probably not the best time to have no army at all given the Saddam Hussein lives next door problem. Yeah, maybe don't murder your entire army yourself. We might need some generals. Oh my God. So he's upset. He's upset. He's getting older. There's some speculation that he was maybe going a bit senile. Mm, He's not in a good place. No. And then... Uh Uh-oh. He heard about the satanic verses, which sent him into an unstable fatwa-issuing frenzy. But not all of the Muslim world leaders threw themselves in support of the fatwa. Actually, quite a lot of them condemned it, not just because it seemed like an overreaction to the novel, but actually because it violated the Prophet's teachings of mercy. Yeah. Again, that's the thing with this whole thing. It's not like as much as maybe some articles from the time in the UK and in other Western parts of the world may have made it seem like it was all the brown people, it was all the Muslims. It wasn't. It was a lot of them. 
lot of them very unhappy. But Ayatollah Khomeini really stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was doing the most. Oh, yeah. Another example of someone who didn't agree, Sheikh Mohammed Hossam de Eddin of Cairo went as far to say that the fatwa made Islam look, quote, brutal and bloodthirsty. And he thought that a much more reasonable course of action was to ban the book and give Rushdie, a Muslim himself, let's remember, a chance to repent. Is Islam bloodthirsty or have we just weaponized offense? Weaponized offense is kind of, we sort of accept it now. But has it always been like that? Sort of kind of yes, no, maybe gray area. I would say weaponized offense has always been the remit of religion. But now weaponized offense in our post-religious modern world mm. has become the remit of anything that anybody finds offensive within the world of what people are trying to force to be the new moral code by which we all live. And that's what I don't like. But I feel like I've made that abundantly clear. <laughs> so what the protesting British Muslims wanted after the advent of the publication of the Satanic Verses was an extension of the blasphemy laws in England to cover other religions in addition to just Christianity. Like most things Christian in English law, the blasphemy laws are Henry VIII's fault. When he fell out with the Pope back in 1534, Blasphemy became a crime. And that is absolutely not even remotely to do with King Henry VIII's beliefs. It was so he could establish a Protestant church in a predominantly Catholic country. What it means is being Catholic was illegal. It doesn't mean he got really upset when you said Jesus Christ. Yeah, it was just like you couldn't challenge him as the divine leader of the Church of England. He was now the head of the Church of England. And anybody saying that he wasn't, aka the Catholics, you were doing a blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get in the tower. Yeah, it has quite literally been hundreds of years since the blasphemy laws have been used for literally anything in this country. So an extension of them is going to be just as useless. Exactly. So blasphemy being illegal isn't new. But one has to admit that it is antiquated. Like Hannah just said, it wasn't even really an anti-blasphemy law. It was an anti-challenging Henry VIII law. And I would also say that it's also... Just not anything that's been used in this country for a long time. Anti-blasphemy laws do exist in other countries. For example, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, they have anti-blasphemy laws. And so basically, the people protesting this were saying we should have the same sort of thing here to protect Islam. Exactly. And they're not really a thing. Unless, of course, fun fact, you happen to be the artist formerly known as Cat Stevens. I vaguely knew about this. I had no idea. I had no idea. Because when I used to work at the Shaftesbury Theatre, there's a roof where people used to have barbecues in the summer and Cat Stevens used to go to those barbecues. Wow. Anyway, Cat Stevens, if you don't know, British multi-instrumentalist and rock and roll hall of famer has been known by the name Yusuf Islam since 1977. In 1989, he told students at Kingston University that Rushdie, quote, must be killed. The Quran makes it clear if someone defames the prophet, then he must die. Oh, well, great. As long as it says it in that book that's thousands of years old, there's no reason for us to think about what that actually means. Naturally, that meant that Cat Stevens, or Cat Yusuf Islam Stevens, was invited to speak about Rushdie quite a lot, because that's how television views work. Oh, yeah. Famous rock and roller who's now saying that we should murder this author. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get mm -hmm. him on. <laughs> So there's quite a few appearances of Cat Stevens talking about the fatwa. You can YouTube all of them, which I would recommend because it is just bonkers. There's a notable one who's on Australian TV. He said that he would only go to an effigy burning protest if they were actually burning Rushdie alive. Yeah, I haven't got any time for these part-timers just burning cardboard <laughs> cutouts <laughs> of the man. Fucking hell. Yeah, there's another one where it's a British panel show and there's like multiple different talking heads, including a police officer like quite high up in the Met and Cat Stevens is there. And I know I should be calling him Yusuf Islam, but I'm not going to. And he is literally saying, you know, he should be murdered. And there's this woman there being like, excuse me, police officer of the law. Are you going to stop this man from talking about actually murdering someone? And the police is like, nah. please don't drag me into this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fucking hell. Cat Stevens, his career never really recovered from these comments. Really? No, not really <laughs> at all. he did the rounds on all but the Sunday morning shows. <laughs> his introduction to the Hall of Fame happened after all of this. Oh, well, you know, so you can't fight progress. <laughs> so apparently he says this on the radio, I think, on Radio 4. He says, I never called for the death of Salman Rushdie, nor backed the fatwa issued by Ayatollah Khomeini, and I still don't. 
Still, the words that he actually spoke with his mouth still follow him around like the rancid stench of burning human flesh that he called for on TV. It's very interesting to me that, like, he's just like, no, I never said that, when there's actual footage of him saying it. Yeah. Roald Dahl weighed in, too. Obviously, I am a, an expert in Roald Dahl. He wrote a letter to the Times calling Rushdie an opportunist who was stoking anti-Islam sentiment to sell books, which coming from a raging anti-Semite like Roald Dahl is a bit rich. Also, I am not a Roald Dahl expert like Mm -hmm. you, although I am and remain to the point that I am dead, I am sure, a massive Roald Dahl fan, his work. Yeah. I didn't know he was a giant wife beater as well. Yeah. Yeah. Bad guy. Bad guy. Didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. If you are unfamiliar with Roald Dahl's anti-Semitism, I'll give you a a quickie. He once said about Jewish people that even a stinker like Hitler wouldn't have picked on them for no reason. And that is a direct quote. Oh, oh, fucking hell. Yeah, it's bad stuff. But again, I can separate the artist from the art. Love the books, hate the guy. Mm -hmm. There's actually a whole documentary, I believe, called The Dark Side of Roald Dahl that the BBC made. So you can check that out. Yep. Also died with no eyebrows. you want to be sad. Oh, why do you have no eyebrows? So he was a very heavy smoker his whole life. And um, when he was in hospital dying, essentially, they were like, you can't smoke, you're dying. And he was like, well, fuck you, I'm Roald Dahl, do whatever I want. So um, his wife at the time, Lissy, smuggled in some cigarettes, didn't bring him a lighter. So he went down to the kitchen of the hospital and lit a cigarette off the gas burning hob and it burned his eyebrows off and he died like a couple of days later with no eyebrows. (laughs) So, yes, we've heard about some famous people involved in this, uh, notably Cat Stevens, Roald Dahl and Stephen King. A threesome I never thought no. I would pull together. <laughs> no. It's like one of those rounds on Have I Got News For You? And it's like Cat Stevens, Salman Rushdie. What do these have in common? Yeah. <laughs> but what about the less famous people? Those who weren't making it onto the news or making it down to the protests? Well, the BBC podcast that Hannah mentioned earlier, Fatwa, does do a good job of answering this question. They spoke to a British-born second-generation Pakistani Muslim named Ayalas Kamani, who tells a reporter, also a British Muslim, that until the fatwa, he was easily accepted by white people. He actually preferred to spend his time with white people. Until the Rushdie affair, when he found that he was being asked over and over again whose side he was on, and why his lot had put a bounty on Salman Rushdie's head. They were asking him, did he agree with the fatwa? Or did he hate the West? There didn't seem to be a whole lot of in-between. Elias actually had no religious beliefs at the time, but his mother certainly did, and he found it difficult to stand by something that upset his mum so much, like the satanic verses. So he found himself supporting the fatwa and distancing himself from his white friends. I really would recommend listening to him speak because he does sound very impassioned about it. But not a great understander of irony, He got himself into some cancellation trouble when he released a song encouraging violence and repeating bomb-making instructions straight out of the anarchist cookbook. Well, that's A-OK then, isn't it, Elias? He was completely outraged by the treatment he received for this song. He said that it was a political statement, which is not the same thing as a religious insult. Which... (sighs) Again, it's just, again, it's like, this is religion's oldest trick, isn't it? It's like, you can't insult this belief that I have. Because I believe it. Because it's a sincerely held belief. So what? And again, in this godless postmodern world that we're in, people have just decided arbitrary other rules of morality that now also can't be questioned. But this is the same thing. It's like, it's fine if it's political, if it's fine this, that and the other, but you can't say it about my religion. Yeah, and I would argue that religion is probably one of the most political things on the planet. Of course it is. Always has been. Absolutely. So while Alias was writing bomb instruction songs, things for Salman Rushdie were only getting worse. The beginning of the 90s were quite possibly the worst time ever to be Salman Rushdie. A film called International Guerrilla was produced in Pakistan, and in this film, Salman Rushdie is the baddie who's hell-bent on disrupting Muslim unity, and he is eventually defeated at the climax of the film by some flying Qurans that shoot him with lasers. What I can't get my head round... Please tell me. Drawing a picture of Muhammad... Death sentence. Flying Qurans, shooting lasers, celebration. Yeah. I mean, I think the rule is you're just not allowed to draw anything living, maybe. Okay. I believe that's what it is. I think it's that you can't make likenesses of like animals, plants and people. 
because only God can do that. Uh Uh-huh. But I don't know for certain. I'm pretty sure that's true. But what do I know? I'm a fucking failed Hindu. We love, (laughs) we love nothing more than a brazen object, than an idol, a deity, an (laughs) idled deity. A gold calf. We're fucking mad for gold calves. They're everywhere. (laughs) You see a gold calf, do you know what you're meant to do? Or any type of calf. You go whisper in its ear what you want to happen. Oh, that's quite nice. Cute, isn't it? Yeah. Story's not so cute. Something about a calf that, I think this is the story. It's like, oh God, yeah, this is fucking brutal. My grandma used to tell me. So it's like a cow who has a baby, who has a calf. And then the king's son is like riding around on his chariot and he hits the calf and kills it. And so the cow runs over to this bell and rings the bell to tell the king what's happened. And the king comes out, gets in his son's chariot and runs his own son over to show his justice, basically. Oh. And then when he does that, the gods look down and bring the calf back to life. And then now you go whisper in that calf's ear and tell it things you want to happen. Cow justice. Magic cow justice. (laughs) Hindu style. So let's get back to the flying Qurans. This film was a mega hit and it was banned in the UK. Not that that made much difference because pirate copies had been handed around so fast that no one actually bothered to see it in the cinema anyway. And the film lost loads of money, even though everyone had seen it. Again, yet another irony of people being so desperate to see it, they watched it on pirate and then didn't pay for it. So it lost a ton of money. In the end, it was only banned for about five weeks in the UK because the film's producers hired the same defence team as Salman Rushdie. That guy's fucking cleaning up. (laughs) Now, they might have solved the problem for the producers of International Guerrilla, but Rushdie's lawyers had a harder time diffusing the fatwa. Rushdie publicly said that he had been taking the fatwa very seriously and was questioning how many days he had left to live. And then he vanished into protective custody at the age of 41. And this next bit is unbelievable because Sam and Rushdie, aged 41, goes into hiding stays there for nearly a decade. During this time, he was escorted from house to house by a team of special agents, often only spending one night in each place. Honestly, that sounds like the fucking worst thing imaginable. And if you're expecting him to have lived in a Bin Laden-style cave hiding existence in total solitude, then I'm afraid you couldn't be more wrong. In true high society style, Rushdie managed to keep up quite the social life. He held and attended dinner parties and even smoked weed in front of his special forces protectors, mainly because one of them had no sense of smell. He's like just having dinner at Ian McKellen's house while he's in hiding. (laughs) This is the thing. It's outrageous that he was in hiding for nearly a decade. Outrageous. But he is rich enough to do what he wants. Mm -hmm. After four years in hiding, Rushdie had a meeting with the Home Office. And the Home Office, whatever faceless drone they sent down to have a meeting with him, That drone was just like, you've got five minutes. And Rushdie said, it's going to take a bit more than five minutes. They're trying to kill me. Yeah, and it's not just random people. It was ordered. It's an ordered hit by Ayatollah Khomeini, so a leader of another country. Yeah. The British government weren't exactly enamoured with Rushdie. He'd always been a vocal critic of Thatcher and had compared Britain to Nazi Germany in some of his previous works. He was seen by the Iron Lady establishment as a troublemaker. And let's face it, Thatcher was never that bothered about protecting brown people, as evidenced by her entire political career and her attitude towards apartheid. So there was no help coming from the government. And Rushdie decided, at his lowest ebb, that his only option was to revert to Islam. Huge mistake. He gave a press release in which he said that he had always had a God-shaped hole in his life where Allah once was. He added that he had no problem with the central tenets of Islam. This conversion apology did not go well. The Muslim community took it for exactly what it was, a desperate last-ditch attempt that didn't work. Oh, once again, just so reminiscent of the many, many failed celebrity apologies over the years. And after all that, we still live with the consequences. The Rushdie affair meant that the far right saw Islam for the first time, and the alt-right narrative in the UK has been all about Muslims ever since. A lot of how Muslims are now perceived in Britain has a lot to do with Salman Rushdie and a novel that was published 33 years ago. In the late 80s, in the liberal echelons of society that Rushdie spent his time smoking weed with liberal elites, religion was perceived to be the enemy of intellect, 
and to be avoided entirely, especially when it came to the oppression of women, art, and minorities. Which, let's face it, they all do. If you read just one article about this, we really, really recommend an article called Islam After Salman by a guy called Bruce Fudge, who is not a character from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. He's a professor in Arabic at the University of Geneva. And what he says is this, is that Rushdie's critique of religion in general, but specifically of Islam, is really not that different to an 18th century Enlightenment critique. The Enlightenment critique is an attitude that thousands, if not millions of people have adopted. Religion being oppressive and bad, and science being liberating and good, and let's not forget, provable. But Rushdie's critique timing couldn't have been worse. The assertion of Islam as an identity, rather than just a religion, was on the rise in the 80s, especially in Britain. And when you look at the Satanic verses and Rushdie's rhetoric as a critique of identity, then it becomes an insult to a marginalised group. And then we get into trouble. That's the thing that's so, so key about this, is if you can't separate yourself from your religion, of course critiquing it is going to upset you. And in his day, Rushdie was the king of the left, like we said earlier. He was anti-racist. And when the Sun newspaper came out in support of him, he actually scoffed, saying, I'd rather be with the rats. He was anti-colonial too, yet people on the left today wouldn't side with Rushdie's representation of Muhammad. The world has changed, and religion has become impossible to critique. Is that where we want to be? A fatwa, a million dollar bounties, and killing a Japanese translator isn't exactly live and let live. Abu Hamza said that Salman Rushdie should be minced. And still today, coming out in support of Salman Rushdie might just get you labelled an Islamophobe. It's interesting, isn't it, how famous old one-hand Abu Hamza can call for Salman Rushdie to be made into mints. But this is the thing, I think it's... Yeah. I also think it's interesting that during the current sort of culture wars or whatever you want to call them, that people find themselves in bed with uncomfortable people that they may disagree with other things on, but mm -hmm. suddenly they're saying the same things you like about one specific topic. I don't know. I wouldn't say that we live in a world that is live and let live. I feel like people say that we are, but I think things have always been polarised. Mm. We've always weaponized offence specifically when it comes to religion, but I think it's the worst it's ever been. And it's interesting, and I would be interested to know what a modern audience's view is of Salman Rushdie and what he did. Because, in my opinion, I'm on Salman Rushdie's side, but that's because I believe in freedom of speech and not in the weaponizing of offence. But what do I know? After nine years, Salman Rushdie came out of hiding. But even when Ayatollah Khomeini died, the fatwa stayed alive. Although Iran has officially stated that they weren't going to send any commandos to go and kill Rushdie, they didn't say they wouldn't send anyone. And the million-dollar bounty has never been removed either. Actually, it's increased, with the last addition to the money pot coming as late as 2016. Even still, Rushdie has made a return to public life. He's continued to write and has even made an appearance on Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's such a good episode. Basically, what happens is he helps Larry David to write Fatwa the Musical, which is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I think what we've been trying to say for the last hour and a half is the real question that we're trying to not answer, but inspect. Is it possible to critique the beliefs, doctrine, rituals and ideology of a marginalised religion without causing offence? And if that isn't possible, if people are inevitably going to be offended, how bad can offence really get? Is offence a call for violence? We don't have an answer for that, but we do have an answer for another question. And that question is, would anyone write or publish the Satanic Verses today? And that answer is a resounding no. No, they would about Christianity, but not about any other religion. I mean, Modi's going full hog on Hinduism, throwing comedians in jail for making jokes about Hinduism. The man's fucking on one and he's running the country. But if you're talking about the culture as it stands in the West, no, I don't think that this book would be accepted. So I think although we're looking at this as like a case that happened 33 years ago, how much have things changed since? If anything, I would say it's gotten worse. And, you know, is that where we want to be? Do we want to get to a place of 
because you know it always comes down to who defines offense who defines what is offensive it's not even just who defines offensive but it's also this thought process we've got into which is that it depends on who you're offending and actually Eamon Dean coming back to conflicted he puts this really really well which is we kind of have this misguided notion now and I don't know how modern this is but that anybody who has power or anybody who's in the majority must automatically be bad and anybody who's in a minority and doesn't have power must automatically be seeking power and therefore must be pure and therefore I think it's not about this idea of causing offence or not causing offence. I think in the modern day, we're very happy to cause offence and say horrible things about people. But as long as they are perceived to be people who are white and male and have power and are Christian, because it doesn't matter. But if you're causing offence to anybody who might be deemed a marginalised group or a minority group, then their offence is more dangerous or is worse. And therefore, we shouldn't do that. And I think that I'm not saying we should go out and seek to commit offence. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is critique. We can critique anybody as long as they're deemed powerful. We can't critique anybody if we deem them to be less so. And I think that's where we are. But that's just my two cents on it. And on that bombshell, (laughs) that has been probably the most political (laughs) red-handed of all time, if you can believe it. But there you are. Just have a think about it. Have a think about it. Or don't. I'm not the boss of you. I'm just your dad. Um, so, <laughs> so we'll see you next time for something else. If you just can't wait for next week, you can hop on over to Spotify for Sinister Societies, which is our exclusive show where we talk about cults and all sorts of other stuff, sometimes fisting. So you can hop on over to that if you feel so inclined. And head on over to patreon.com slash redhanded if you're not yet a patron where you can sign up at any tier you fancy and then get your hands, eyes, ears, all of it on some delicious weekly bonus content from us. And if you still haven't got any merch for your back, head on over to redhandedshop.com where you can find a very limited edition of a vast array of red-handed merch. Very limited edition rod for your own back. Yeah, precise. Signed by both of us. None of them are signed. (laughs) But (laughs) check that out and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.